the other two consultants, they were very heavily focused on head and neck reconstruction. That was the main thing that they were doing. So there was nobody else doing these cosmetic work. So I ended up doing more than my share of cosmetic work, which I don't mind at all. And the greatest part of that is obviously rhinoplasty. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to another episode of the Rhinoplasty Podcast with me, Dr. Cameron McIntosh. So we're in the month of August and August's broadcasts have been enabled by Pentax Loops. Guys, Pentax Loops are incredible. They're really, really good. It's amazing how much they help us in our surgery. So a big shout out to Karina and her team. Please contact me if you want uh, any information further about them. But yeah, without any further ado, let's climb into today's guests and Guys, we've done this, we've tried to record this a few times before, but finally we, we, we are now going to be doing it properly. And I'm really excited that all the way from Karachi, Pakistan, I've got Zia Ul Islam as my guest today. Zia, welcome to today's episode. Thank you very much, Cam. It's fantastic to be with you. You have so much energy all the time. It's always lovely. So Zia, we were just speaking off air about some really good news that you received this week. Uh, do you want to tell the listeners a little bit more about that? Yes. Uh, plastic surgery in Pakistan is a very rapidly developing speciality. And to date, we did not have a dedicated association or society for the aesthetic surgery in Pakistan. And we just yesterday, after a year's hard work, got an association registered. And we are still in the process of uh, formulating its bylaws and everything. And we are having a fantastic international meeting in September in Pakistan. It's uh, mainly based on rhinoplasty, the structural versus the preservation rhinoplasty. It's going to be a great event, and I'm really looking forward to it. So tell us, when is that event going to be taking place? Yeah, in September from 9th to 11th. Lahore wow. is a beautiful city in Pakistan. It's very vibrant. It's known for its fantastic food and its hospitality. It's a beautiful city. And wow, that's that, why we have that's... chosen that city to host our first ever meeting. And it will be a live surgery meeting. We'll have four uh, live rhinoplasty surgeries. Wow, that's just like ours is going to be in, in November. Wow, that is really, really great. So Zia, I mean, we've just been hearing you talk about this new conference you're having, but I have two questions. Give me your history and give me history about rhinoplasty in Pakistan, please. Okay, I'll start with my history. Uh, I went to the military at a very young age. I was 18 when I joined the Army Medical College in Rawalpindi, which is the military base of the country. And from there, I graduated as a general duty medical officer working in the field and then joined a general surgery program, worked as a consultant general surgeon for a while. Then I came into plastic surgery. There was uh, a lot of internal conflicts going on, and we had fight on terror going on in our part of the world. So the plastic surgery was a very sought-after field. And since retiring, my workload has basically focused uh, on aesthetic, and a large part of that aesthetic is rhinoplasty. Interestingly, uh, a larger percentage of my rhinoplasty patients is males. And there has been a big boom. Uh, you might also have noticed that after the COVID lockdown. In COVID lockdown, my personal rhinoplasty practice changed tremendously. My technique changed and my workload changed. So there has been a lot of change. Then we founded a rhinoplasty oh, wow. society, and then now we, we have this aesthetic society, and we'll probably merge these two. That's amazing. Now, tell me, one of the other things I found so interesting is this weekly quiz. So tell the listeners a little bit about this quiz that you run. Yeah, I have been involved in the training of uh, young residents for a very long time now. It's been 12 years that I've involved with training residents, not just mine but all across Pakistan and now after the COVID lockdown all across the world. I have residents everywhere. So every Sunday we choose three chapters from a textbook and have a live quiz. There are 20 questions. Each question needs to be answered in 45 seconds. 
uh, anybody can attempt that whoever answers it correctly gets points and who answers quickly they get more points so at the end of that we have a table of who is at the top and after a whole cycle we can sum up the whole experience who's doing good in which topics they need to improve and what they are comfortable with so it has been a very very uh, successful program so far we have completed one cycle in which we covered the entire syllabus and now we are on to the second cycle and how do people manage to get on or get selected to be able to be someone to try and answer questions any resident from any part of the world is welcome to join that and it's uh, it's done through two applications one is the zoom that we normally are using and then there is a live online quizzing platform called the quizzes so the quiz is uploaded Fantastic. on that quizzes and is run through the zoom app so they can use their phones to just click the answers now, now, tell me a little bit. I'm so interested. I mean, when we go through the history of rhinoplasty, the subcontinent is kind of where it all started. How, how within uh, medicine in Pakistan, is, this, is it a plastic surgery speciality? Is it an ENT speciality? Who are the kind of people who are doing rhinoplasty in Pakistan? So what uh, the, the history that you are referring to was the uh, nasal reconstruction by the old Indian people. The Shushreta Samheta you're talking about. Uh, yes. In the beginning, from what I remember, since I'm a plastic surgeon, there was a very prominent plastic surgeon in, based in Lahore in Pakistan. He was exclusively doing rhinoplasties. Although all plastic surgeons were doing rhinoplasty, but there was this one guy who was exclusively doing only rhinoplasties. Uh, then about uh, five or uh, four or five years ago, the ENT people got an interest in doing rhinoplasties and a couple of them started doing and teaching and working on their skills in rhinoplasty. So now it is a sort of mix. Still the plastic surgeons are leading the way, but there is a considerable number of uh, ENT people doing rhinoplasty. So these are the two people uh, doing rhino. In my setup, uh, it's just plastic surgery. In the hospital that I work in, only the plastic ones. Okay, fantastic. Now, in terms of uh, uh, the whole uh, wave of preservation rhinoplasty, is that um, something that's been happening in Pakistan for many years, or is it something new? Or whereabouts are you guys in that at the moment? Very recent, honestly, Cameron. I recent, uh, my knowledge about uh, preservation is very recent, and I think it's not uh, more than four or five years that it has come to my knowledge. It has started happening in Pakistan. We have started doing it, but not a lot of it. We are still reluctant. And as we are holding this conference, it is the main reason is that we want to get uh, a know-how of it and we want to become comfortable with it. Uh, mm. after, after seeing so many people doing rhinoplasty, what I've realized is that no single person's technique is the final word. And I feel there should be a bit of everything that you should know so that you are able to deal with the diverse nose conditions. We get a very wide variety of nose conditions here. Yeah, I wanted to ask you that. I mean, the ethnicity of somebody who comes from Pakistan, you see, you see at your practice, how wide is it? Are, are, is there a lot of nose that you perhaps have to augment? There, there's more where you have to maybe um, decrease the sizes? Tell us a little bit about what the kind of patient load is, because it's very interesting you say there's so many male patients who come for rhinoplasty. Yes, my major workload is male patients. I have greater percentage of male patients, and uh, there is a huge history of SMR being done in Pakistan, the submucosal resection. Anybody who had a breathing problem went to an ENT surgeon who did a submucosal resection of that uh, septum. And I see a lot of them patients coming back to me with depressed nose. Uh, apart from, yeah, I, I yeah. do a lot of that. I do a lot of that. And apart from that, the ethnic Pakistani nose or the South Indian nose is a bit of a hump from the Greek influence that we had and a very droopy tip with very thick skin, sebaceous skin. That is a typical yes, South yes. Asian nose. And that's something. Okay. Apart from that, there is one more ethnic 
uh, thing that we see a very flat nose in areas in the north of Pakistan and Balochistan. We get a ethnic nose that is very flat with a very broad base and almost an absent side walls and septum. I mean, what is your general technique for addressing those noses? Uh, the ethnic ones? Yeah, that, yes. that's augmentation. Uh, there are, you, you would know, uh, you, you are the master, uh, that there are a lot of things that we do in noses, but the basic techniques, how I go inside, divide, that remains, uh, despite my efforts at changing it, it has remained constant over years. I do an open technique, I open up the uh, lower lateral cartilages, then the upper lateral cartilages, address the septum and then go on from there what is required. So that basic has not changed over time. But for these ethnic noses, I find that this Turkish delight has been extremely useful for us. It has mm. served mm. very well in my hands at least. And I know that other uh, people doing rhinoplasties in Pakistan, they rely very heavily on Turkish delight. There are a couple of things that I have uh, learned from experience about this Turkish delight. One is to never let it uh, come onto the tip because it can never give the tip definition. It never works. So it has to be away from the tip. And then the mm -hmm. it has to be very tightly wrapped and the dicing should be very, very fine because sometimes when mm -hmm. patients have a fine skin, it becomes, sometimes the particles become visible. But apart from that, the immense advantage is that if even on the second day of surgery, the patient is not happy with the shape, you can still mold it. So that's fantastic. And I found it extremely useful in these ethnic noses and the redo ones. I, I do a lot of somehow redo ones. So it's very, very useful in these two situations. Yeah, yeah. Now, now tell the listeners very interestingly, your link to Africa. Um, yeah. How did you end up having fellows <laughs> come and visit you in Karachi in Pakistan? <laughs> yes. So the, this uh, weekly quiz that we were talking about, it's a sort of international thing. Uh, residents from all over log into it, from Iraq, from Zambia, Nairobi, uh, everywhere, Egypt. So there was these two residents from Rwanda who were attending this regularly. And also we have a six monthly online uh, preparatory course for the plastic surgery residents appearing in the exam. So they contacted me that they wanted to come over. In Rwanda, the plastic surgery program started three years ago. So their first batch of uh, residents is now in their final year of training and they wanted a greater exposure. So I, I was absolutely delighted and very excited to have them over. And I am sure it was a good experience for them as well. So I have had two residents who have been with us and gone back. And now I have the third one with me. I hope this trend continues. And I would love to visit them sometime in their country. That we, we, we want you in Africa. We want you to come visit. But Zia, tell us a little bit more um, about your practice. Uh, yeah, where, where are you working? Um, are you full-time in private? Do you work in the state as well? Um, very interested to know what you yeah. do. So I retired from the military in 2018 and directly joined a private hospital. It's a very big tertiary care private hospital in Karachi. It's the biggest in the country. And I joined here as a consultant and have been working here. We are three consultants here and we have about four or five residents. The residency program dates back to, uh, I, I think, another 10 years. So the other two consultants, they were very heavily focused on head and neck reconstruction. That was the main thing that they were doing. So there was nobody else doing these cosmetic work. So I ended up doing more than my share of cosmetic work, which I don't mind at all. And the greatest part of that is obviously rhinoplasty. Fantastic. Eh? And um, so from the military, um, Again, we're chatting off air. What do you do when you are not doing rhinoplasty and you have this passion for teaching people around the world? What do you do to let your hair down a bit? 
uh, the most most of my free time is generally spent in making quiz or having a session with some group of students because we have an examination every six months. So whenever an examination ends, a fresh batch of candidates who are to appear in the next exam, they somehow join me either physically or through the Zoom link or something, and we have regular sessions. So that that take up, they, uh, but that take up. Zia, you being humble now, you must tell us a bit about your archery. Man. Yeah, <laughs> I, I love that sport. I took it up after my retirement in 2018. It, it's a lovely sport. It's very elegant and it gives a lot of focus and peace. So I'm just an amateur trying to be uh, come to a professional level. The archery team of Pakistan is still not a very noticeable team on the international arena, but I hope it will be in due course. That's fantastic. That's great. Now, another topic I want to delve into a little bit is about um, like academics and, and, and publications and papers. Um, I think that's also something that, that you really enjoy. Hey? Uh, I do not have a lot of publications. That's my weak spot about. Uh, although I enjoy uh, teaching and my publications are basically focused on teaching plastic surgery. And my current but research is interest is that we can teach equally well online and my 100%. Yeah, and my goal is to prove or disprove that an exit exam can be done online because in my opinion there is i have been an examiner in plastic surgery for a very long time now and in my opinion uh, there are 15 factors that we judge uh, during an exam an exit exam, and 13 of them can be done online. So there's just two things. Really? So uh, if you are just a bit clever and a bit innovative, there is so much software and platforms available that you can do practically everything online. And I, I'm just trying to work on that, doing a bit of research. Uh, still, there is a lot of hesitancy from the consultants from established examiners, they do not feel that uh, this is something that will be uh, possible. But let's see. I'm researching on that. Wow. So, so I'm, I'm sorry. I mean, coming back to this thing we said about um, it's not really the publications, it's how much you can contribute and how much you're teaching, which is really great. And you spoke about these 15 things. Explain that a little bit more in detail. I really want to know about this. So basically, when uh, someone graduates after the exit exam, they are supposed to be able to independently manage a patient. And that mm -hmm. management includes evaluating the patient, investigating the patient, uh, counseling the patient, doing the surgery, and then following up. And in that, mm -hmm. there are subsets of things that need to be assessed. And of those things mm -hmm. are his, his or her clinical acumen, uh, knowledge, interpretation of skills, interpretation of findings, uh, hand skills. So there are just these two things that we cannot judge online, which is this uh, clinical skill and the history taking part. Now, one of this, okay. the clinical skill, the surgical skill is not checked in any exit exam anywhere in the world. We are certifying our candidates uh, on doing surgery without checking. So why the only thing is, what's history taking? If there are many ways to assess if the candidate will be able to take a good history uh, online, shouldn't be a problem without a real patient. In the mm -hmm. American mm -hmm. uh, board exam, there are no patients. They just discuss case scenarios, which can be done online, shouldn't be a problem. Yeah, yeah. And I have been doing it. Wow, that's yeah, interesting. Yeah, I'll tell you what I did. Uh, every six months, I have this uh, preparatory course in which there are examiners from all around the world and there are candidates from around the world. So one candidate is being examined by two examiners who are not sitting together, they are in different parts of the world, and they both assess the candidate separately, and they give a marking. And then we 
evaluate those markings and we find that there is an excellent uh, inter interpreter reliability so both yes. the examiners yes. are giving the same markings uh, about the same markings to the candidate so this becomes a very reliable way of evaluating the candidate mm -hmm. hmm. So, Zia, I, I really like your energy, man, uh, that, that you've retired from the military and yet you're still teaching, etc. So, as a final kind of uh, questions I want to have is, if, if you look back at your career, what have some of the, the lowlights been and what have some of the highlights been in decades of being a plastic surgeon? Yeah, the lowlights definitely was when I couldn't get enough patients to operate on. In military life, you are not always operating a lot many sometimes you are operating on 20 patients at one time and sometimes you are sitting for a year doing nothing uh, you are you are supposed to be at a place and that place needs a surgeon you have to be there whether there is a war going on or not there is work or not you have to be there so th that uh, to any surgeon any surgeon not working would be a mm -hmm. low point but definitely the yeah. high point uh, the transition from the military to army I think that it was a fantastic thing because coming from a hard life to an easy life, it's lovely. Nobody minds that. <laughs> That's yeah. great, eh? Wow. It's so interesting to hear this. I mean, I've so enjoyed these podcasts of just being able to understand what makes people tick, climb into a little bit of the surgical techniques, etc. So last question. Um, if you would see the the future of where rhinoplasty is going i'd love to hear some of your comments about that yeah i see a lot of predictability in rhinoplasty because the skills are improving at such a rapid rate that i, I i'm very strongly convinced that we will be able to give patients an exact uh, image of what we are going to do and replicate that in the actual result that's cool that's very cool so yeah zia thank you so much for taking uh time out thank you for what you're doing with the quiz it's fantastic and well done on on your guys conference that's coming up in, in september i hope it's a huge success you. you mentioned you've got some of the world's best surgeons coming do you want to maybe tell the people who's coming from an international side yeah uh, we have uh, from mexico a body contouring surgeon umberto uh, he'll be with us and from turkey where we have dr ilad and dr suraya uh, dr suraya is a very senior rhinoplasty surgeon with a lot of uh, experience in structural rhinoplasty and also now in preservation rhinoplasty. So basically, we will be having many symposia on structural versus uh, preservation rhinoplasty so that we convince oh, our own audience what is good and what is bad. And I so guys if you have the opportunity get there go and go and be a part of this great conference um i just want to give a shout out also to pentax loops again for enabling today's episode and this whole month of august actually and uh listeners from around the world thank you guys thank you so much for a weekly tuning into the podcast um we we've got uh, one more month after this in september we'll be ending season two but a big shout out to all of you and 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 Zia, thank you so much for being uh, willing and and teaching us thank today. you very much cameron it was lovely it was fantastic talking to you 